Welcome to Little Known Black History Facts. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Virginia Christian, Forsaken and Alone. Virginia Christian, at the age of 16 years old, was the only female juvenile executed in the USA during the 20th century. Virgie, as she was called, had only about three years of education, from ages 10 to 13. Born August 15, 1895, she was mentally retarded and, at best, semi-literate. She stopped taking classes to support her family. Her mother, Charlotte, had become paralyzed a few years before and couldn't work. She was mentally retarded, black, working class, and poor, with a mother crippled by disability and unable to raise her as she wanted to. Virginia was therefore lucky to secure a job as a housemaid to 52-year-old Ida Balot. Balot was a member of Virginia's white aristocracy who had been born 11 years before the start of the Civil War and who seems to have retained certain white Southern attitudes to black employees. She was known to regularly mistreat Christian, assaulting her on a number of occasions. It was normal behavior that ultimately cost both Ida Balot and Virginia Christian their lives. The case of Virginia Christian stands out for a number of reasons. She was the last woman electrocuted in Virginia and the last woman executed there until 2010. Her crime, trial, and execution raises deeply uncomfortable questions about the roles played in American capital punishment by the race and social class of both defendants and their alleged victims. After being mistreated for some time by her employer, Christian and Balot came to blows yet again on March 18, 1912, this time with fatal consequences for both of them. Balot, under the impression that Virginia had stolen a locket and a skirt, threatened to have her arrested. Their verbal argument quickly escalated to a physical confrontation. Balot, according to Christian, struck her with a metal spittoon and then both reached for a pair of broomsticks used to prop open a window. Christian struck her across the head and fearing that anybody nearby might hear Balot's screams, stuffed a towel into her mouth, stole her purse and some money and a ring before fleeing the house. By the time Ida Balot was found, she had suffocated on the towel, which Christian, having stuffed it in her mouth, had also managed to push it into her throat. Virginia Christian was now in desperate trouble. Ida Balot's 13-year-old daughter discovered the body upon returning home. Neighbors stated that they saw Virginia leaving the house that day. At Virginia's home, police found bloody clothes stuffed under Virginia's mattress, splatters of blood on her shoes, Balot's purse containing $5 under her skirts, and a ring belonging to one of Balot's youngest daughters. Virginia was arrested very shortly after the discovery of Balot's body and quickly confessed to the fight and the theft of the purse, money, and ring as she fled the scene. She did, however, strenuously deny any intent whatsoever to murder her employer. Christian's story didn't cut much ice with either the detectives or the public. A wealthy white lady, part of Virginia's white aristocracy, had been killed by a poor black, mentally retarded housemaid. Public opinion was not about a fair trial, but just the punishment. Whether or not she would be dragged from the jail and lynched before the trial date had even been set. State Governor William Mann, who was also the last of Confederate soldiers to serve as governor of Virginia, described it as one of the most wicked and cruelest crimes in Virginia history and stated afterward that Virginia's execution was necessary to protect public safety. Seeing as Governor Mann was Christian's last hope for clemency in the event of her being convicted and condemned, her already perilous situation had just become infinitely worse. The trial began in Hampton, which was where the crime had been committed. Her lawyers had been denied permission for a change of venue. Despite the best efforts of her black lawyers, who were too scared to put her on the stand and let her testify in her own defense, fearing a general backlash against black people, she started her trial on April 8, 1912. The constant beatings from Ida were not taken into consideration or as the evidence of self-defense. Christian's trial lasted two days. The jury of 12 white men deliberated for less than an hour before finding her guilty of first-degree murder. The judge told her to stand. He sentenced her to the electric chair. 
Stern, her attorney, cited the law that stated that first-time juvenile defendants under the age of 17 should be sent to a reformatory. Governor Mann overruled their motion, stating that the state had no reform schools for black girls. In the confession she gave to reporter Charles Mears after her sentencing, she said Ida Balot started a physical altercation and she never intended to kill her. The state of Virginia's constitution prohibited the execution of juveniles, but the state insisted she was an adult despite evidence and testimony about her age. The penitentiary would be her last home. Virginia Christian cell was in view of the death cell and the electric chair where she was sitting in her cell on her birthday. She was looking into another room where she knew she would die the next morning. We're talking about a child and that she is the only female juvenile ever executed in the history of Virginia, including colonial days. She was uneducated and had little means to protect herself at all. Jim Crow society was certainly against her in every way and she was helpless and alone. She asked the newspaper men to be brought to her cell because she was so upset that she had not been allowed in the court to testify and to tell her side of the story. Dozens of people wrote letters to Governor Mann to try to stop the execution. There is only one known photo of Virginia Christian taken while in custody. Wearing a loose white frock, she is staring directly into the camera lens. There is a heaviness in her expression. She looks scared, sad, and alone. Even though she admitted that she had gotten into a vicious fight with her employer five months before, she insisted that she hadn't intended to kill that old woman. Folks didn't seem to care, though. People wanted to see her dangling from a noose. News reports denigrated her by calling her names like the N-word, pointing out her broken English, and they literally painted her as dumb, immoral, and ugly. The news reports even used that as a reason why her attorneys didn't allow her to testify. They wrote that she was a Negro girl, ignorant, uncouth, and not by any means prepossessing in appearance. And they feared she incensed the all-white jury. At 7.30 a.m., August 16th, Virginia was executed, a day after her 17th birthday. Following her execution, Virginia's body was turned over to the state medical school to be used for experimentation purposes as her parents could not afford to transport the body for Richmond. However, despite the reports that her body was not claimed or donated to the University of Virginia Medical School, she was indeed returned home for burial two days after the execution. Further research is needed to know if the remains were returned intact. Until next time, if you like little known history facts as I do, please like, share, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Press the bell to be notified of future uploads. Thank you for watching.